Hi, and welcome to Why Do We Do That, a psychology podcast that deconstructs human behavior from the perspectives of social scientists, psychologists, and others that use applied psychology in their work. I'm your host, Dr. Ryan Moyer. In this episode, I sat down with social psychologist Dr. Richard Nisbet. Richard is the Theodore M. Newcomb Distinguished University Professor Emeritus of Psychology at the University of Michigan. Richard's research has spanned countless topics under the umbrella of thinking and reasoning. He received the Award for Distinguished Scientific Contributions from the American Psychological Association and many other national and international awards. He's also written numerous books, including The Geography of Thought, How Asians and Westerners Think Differently and Why, Intelligence and How to Get It, Why Schools and Cultures Count, Mindware, Tools for Smart Thinking, and most recently, Thinking, a Memoir. This was definitely a bucket list conversation for me. Richard's early work on how individuals aren't very good at verbally explaining how they think and make decisions is one of the most cited papers in the field. I really enjoyed hearing Richard talk about some of his favorite experiments. He still expresses a delight in sharing the findings of an interesting study, even though I would guess he's talked about the study hundreds of times over the past 50 years. One key takeaway for me is how learning a few simple statistical principles can make you a significantly better thinker. He emphasized the law of large numbers, but there are countless others that are equally helpful. Our conversation about rational thinking also stirred up a lot of thoughts about our current political climate, which we touch on briefly towards the end of the interview. We are living in a time where expert opinions can be overridden by tacit Google searches, and any evidence that goes against our preconceived notions is wrong or part of some sort of conspiracy. Upon completing our conversation, I was reminded of a quote by neurologist and skeptical activist Stephen Novella. Quote, Part of the point of science and skepticism is to transcend this basic human psychology by investing in a process, not a conclusion. The process of science. It is better to listen to whatever logic and evidence says is most likely to be true rather than what we wish to be true, or whichever side we have already invested in. We also recognize that many scientific topics are very complex and require a large body of specialized knowledge in order to know and understand the relevant evidence. This is why we look to expert opinion to help us make sense of complex questions, and why a consensus of expert opinion should not be casually tossed aside. End quote. So without further ado, here is my talk with Dr. Richard Nisbet. I am here with Richard Nisbet today. Thank you so much for being on the show. I I really appreciate it. Sure. Um, I I almost don't know where to start, given the breadth of your research in social psychology. Um, But uh, let's start by talking about uh, reasoning. you know, there are lots of lots of different mental processes that that you could have chosen in order to uh, to do your research on, um, you know, memory, perception. Uh, what interested you particularly about looking into reasoning and thinking? I think the, the first uh, work that I did that made me wonder what the heck is going on in people's heads. Uh, was an experiment where I gave people a placebo pill, which I said would cause autonomic arousal, physiological arousal, heart rate increases, breathing rate irregularity, sweaty palms, and so on. So I'm giving you that pill, and I want to see how it affects um, your response to pain. And I give people electric shock, hook hook them up with electrodes, and I'd say, I want to know <clears throat> when they first feel the shock, when it first becomes painful, and when it becomes too painful to continue. And people who thought they had taken a pill causing physiological arousal took four times the amperage of people who did not have such a pill or had a pill with 
bunch of junk symptoms which don't correspond to anything. <coughs> I knew what was going on in people's heads. Physiological arousal amplifies the experience of pain, especially if it's something as weird as electric shock. And uh, what I did was to just take the experience of arousal out of their total experience. So now they don't interpret the arousal as evidence that this thing is really bothering them. So after people uh, had uh, been through the experiment, if they'd been in the experimental condition with the arousal instructions, um, I would say, gee, you notice you took a lot of shock. Um, why is that? And they said, well, you know, I used to build radios and I got electric shock. And I say, well, I'm sure that could have happened. Uh, the line of question, we get closer and closer to the question of what were you thinking about that physiological arousal? I, I wasn't thinking about it. I mean, I, you know, I had, my mind was too occupied with the electric shock. Okay. And I finally would say, here's the hypothesis. I said, uh, you will uh, take more shock if you believe that the arousal you experience has nothing to do with the shock but it's caused by the pill. And they say, oh, well, yeah, oh, that's interesting. I'm sure that would be true for a lot of people, but see, I used to build radios and I would get a lot of shock. Okay. People had no idea of what was going on in their heads. They did not know what their reasoning was. They weren't aware that they'd been reasoning at all about this. So that gave rise to a lot of research, which comes to the conclusion that we're thinking about things all the time, reasoning about them all the time, and we don't know what the heck is going on in our heads. I mean, um, it's only sort of special circumstances like doing arithmetic when we know what's going on in our heads. But if it's responding to the social behavior of someone else or any number of other problems uh, that we right. encounter. Right, so um, yeah, so I, I, I know a lot of your early work was looking at uh, our ability to understand the underlying, the inner workings of the mind and how we basically just do a, a poor job at understanding all types of mental processes like you just, like you just described. Um, what are, uh, so let's, let's explore this a little bit more. What are some other uh, areas in which humans just don't really have a, they're, they're, they're just not really good at understanding the inner workings of their mind? Well, um, I, we don't understand. A lot of our learning takes place absolutely without conscious awareness. And my favorite example of this is a study done by people who put a, a, a matrix, two by two matrix, four boxes on a screen. And they're gonna put an X on the screen and in a particular location. And they ask the subject to predict where the X will appear. <clears throat> without the subject's knowledge, there are some very complicated rules that determine where that X is going to appear. It never appears in the same box twice. Uh, it never uh, appears in box four unless it's just previously occur occurred in box two and so on. Very complicated rules. People start out at chance level and they get pretty good at it. And then the experimenter stops the experiment and says, okay, it's great. Uh, oh no, actually, first, before the experiment is stopped, the experimenter changes the rules. So it's now totally different rules determining where that X appears. And of course, the subject's behavior falls apart. They're back at chance level. So the experimenter says, gee, you were doing so well there for a while. How come you, know, you, you stopped doing so well? So I, I, I don't know, I just lost the rhythm. Um, or uh, there were some psychology professors in the study and they said, I, I think you were putting subliminal messages on the screen to, to distract me. I said, are you aware of the fact that there were some very specific rules that determined where the X appeared? No, I, I had no idea. It's just intuition. I was just guessing. Uh, so <laughs> an awful lot of our learning in everyday life goes on without our conscious awareness. People often say, well, you know, why would that be? And I said, well, you know, it, to have to be aware of all your mental processes, that, that would use up a lot of brain real estate. I mean, why waste it? I mean, just 
learn the dang stuff. You know, don't you don't have to to uh, have articulated rules about what I've learned. Yeah, the um, <clears throat> yeah, I I, I uh, talk to my students a lot about about how you know we'd have to offload some of some processes to to the subconscious so that we can kind of focus on more more important things like that. Um, I that, that expression. Right, right. Um, and so, that, I mean, that kind of brings up um, uh, some some other work. Uh, in the previous episodes, I've talked about um, the dual process nature of our mind and how we have sort of this emotional system that learns through experience. And then we have this, uh, this other part of our mind that is more... Um, uh, that's uh, that uses more logic and thinking and 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 that is that is within conscious awareness um, uh, in terms of in terms of thinking and reasoning um, do we do we need both systems do we need do we need emotion and logical thinking in order to engage in in sort of advanced reasoning the type of things that humans can do well Certainly, if the problem is a fundamentally social one, uh, it, there's going to be emotions uh, involved uh, and uh, in my seeking for approval or avoiding punishment or finding myself charmed or whatever. Uh, and I'm going to be thinking about these things and I'm going to be experiencing various things, including emotions that are a part of the whole experience. So you, you brought up a sort of a, a, a social context. Um, you know, sometimes uh, sometimes I I uh, explain to my students that we're you know we're really good at thinking when it comes to uh, sort of ch you know s sort of challenges that were reasonable that our ancestors might have faced. Uh, we can think about those sort of things, but if it's something completely novel, that's when it might be a little bit more difficult. Um, is, is that what, what you see with the, the patterns in terms of how people, uh, when they make mistakes in reasoning, it, is it consistent with what you would expect? Are they better at challenges that uh, would have affected our ancestors? Well, yeah, I think in general, <clears throat> situations that we've experienced before uh, we're quite likely to know how we're going to behave and, and why we behave as we did. But in novel situations, we can be just way, way off the mark. We don't necessarily know what we're responding to. <clears throat> we don't know what uh, rules we're using to understand uh, what's going on. Um, and I, th I think it, it's actually this distinction between previously experienced situations and novel ones is very important. I think they're just completely different kinds of things often. So what are some examples of a context that humans are particularly good at when it comes to thinking and problem solving versus something that we're not good at? Well, let's take getting acquainted, meeting someone for the first time. <clears throat> That's a very common experience. We know what's likely to happen. We know what things the other person might do that would affect us in some particular way. We're, we, we pretty much know what's going on. I mean, but uh, contrast that with a situation where somebody's given you a pill that's going to cause autonomic arousal and they're going to give you electric shocks. And, I mean, <clears throat> this is all brand new. Uh, we don't have any basis for knowing why we behave as we did. And the, we get thrown off uh, by the fact that it, we experience a particular situation very often. We think we know why we behaved what we did by examining our brains. That's not the case. <laughs> we know why we did what we did because we've done it before and we've induced what are the rules that account for our behavior in that situation, uh, and then learned them, stored them in memory. Uh, that's very yeah. different from reading off the process as it occurs. Yeah, it's and it's isn't isn't the key word here plausible? Like we 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 come up with sort of 
plausible explanations for why we arrived at a conclusion. Um, and then if it's, and then plausible, and then you add into that mix, something maybe self-serving, right? If we're trying to explain how, we, you know, uh, how we, in the example of finding the X's and finding the pattern, the, we want nothing more than to tell someone, look, I figured it out. Anytime you give somebody a riddle, you know, all they want to do is say, yep, I got it. And, and it's interesting because I've done, um, uh, you know, there are these, uh, there are these kind of puzzles that you can give people, uh, students, uh, I've given them to students once where it's like, uh, you give them uh, two, uh, I'm going on a trip and I'm going to take apples and berries and you have to have, have everyone try to figure out what the pattern is, right? So in that case, you give them examples over and over again, apples and berries. Uh, um, uh, and uh, I can bring uh, balls and um, uh, anyway, well, the, the, the point is that I can only bring objects that have double letters, right? And what's interesting is you always, anytime I've done this in a classroom, you always see students perk up way before they actually get the solution. Now, a lot of students will figure it out and, they'll, and, and sometimes they'll test out their theories, but many times they're all, they're, oh, I got it. Oh, I got it. I definitely have it. And, and I think that's, that's kind of interesting, kind of speaks to some other things that are going on in our head when we're engaging in, in intense thought. Right. I, I like that example a lot. I mean, um, the perking up. I mean, we can know something before we know we know it. <laughs> uh, and that's probably what's going on with your students. I mean, uh, it's sort of the inkling of an idea of what this thing is about is beginning to occur to them. And so they brighten up. Yeah. And, and I think they also, um, they don't care to test it out fully. They think it, if, if they have it right once or twice, that, okay, okay, I got it. It's like, well, well, hold on. Give me some examples to, to know you're right. And then they say, you know, bats and gloves. And it's like, well, no, that you can't bring bats and gloves. Uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't fit the pattern. And then they have to go back again. Um, so <clears throat> let's, let's go back a little bit and, and, uh, and talk about some of the things that you discuss in one of your books, Mindware. You talk about um, different uh, different heuristics, different ways in which we can understand the world we live in. Uh, basically, uh, ideas that make us better thinkers. Could you talk about some of some of these ideas that make us better thinkers? Well, <clears throat> I have my overall wrap here is. Um, but the human mind has changed spectacularly in the last 200 years. <clears throat> the first big jump was produced by the uh, Industrial Revolution. People had to learn to read and write uh, in order to function in many of the jobs that were coming available with the Industrial Revolution. And without our awareness, including without the awareness really of psychologists, we were learning all kinds of things for free from what we were reading uh, and, uh, and what we were learning in, in mathematics uh, classes. Um, and to give an example, uh, you probably know about James Flynn, uh, uh, the uh, discoverer of the Flynn effect, which is, shows that people have increased their IQ enormously in the last, he, says 50 years, but really probably goes back, I mean, hundreds of years. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, he gives the example of the kind of mental operation, which is very difficult for pre-industrial people or for people with very little in the way of formal education. He would say to his, his father, his father was born in 1875. Glenn himself died at the age of 80, so, so we were talking about somebody who he had almost, where maybe would have a little bit of, of elementary school, that's it. 
And if you uh, ask his father, well, how do you think you would feel about that if you were a woman? He would say, well, that's ridiculous. I, I'm not a woman. I couldn't be a woman. I mean, the whole concept of a counterfa counterfactual reasoning, suppose this were the case, what with a, just it was beyond him. It wasn't something he could do. Our beautiful study of Russian peasants where an uh, investigator tells these peasants who had no formal education, says, um, as you know, all of the bears in the North are white. Uh, you know, I got a, a letter from a friend recently who lives in the North. He told me he had seen a bear. What color do you suppose it was? And these peasants would say, how should I know? Ask your friend who saw the bear. <laughs> right. Now, what they're missing there is something we think is hardwired, and it may be in some sense, but it's not totally hardwired. It's, it's, it's modus ponens. If P, then Q. P, therefore Q. You know, if North, uh, then White. Uh, north, therefore White. Uh, that sort of automatic, logical form of reasoning is something that's new under the sun. I mean, for the most intelligent people and the most literate people in previous eras, this was part of their equipment, but it didn't become part of everybody's equipment until the Industrial Revolution. Now we live in a different revolution, namely the Information Revolution. And there are all kinds of cognitive tricks that we need to have to navigate. Well, navigating a revolution is not, not a happy combination of words in order to deal with this revolution that we live in. And I can talk about some of those if you'd like. Yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll circle around to these, to these tricks. Um, I, I did wanna ask you about that example, because I, I, I think my guess is that if you ask the average person to explain why they, you know, somebody couldn't uh, you know, engage in these hypotheticals, they probably just, I, I would guess that most people would say, oh, it's just an intelligence issue. He's just not as intelligent as some, uh, he's not as intelligent as another person who could be able to do these hypotheticals. Is, is that fair or is it, is it possible that there's just, you know, that individual in that example is extremely intelligent when it comes to, um, you know, growing crops better but when you give them a hypothetical they're not very intelligent like is there something there or is it just kind of they're just not they're just not quite as intelligence overall in some sort of global sense well i think it, it's part of intelligence understanding how to deal with a counterfactual that's part of intelligence today it wasn't really part of intelligence 500 years ago i mean i didn't have to deal i mean uh, God, it's time to plant the south 40 I'm, I don't need to have the ability to deal with abstract counterexamples or counterfactuals. Uh, and similarly for an abstract version, a highly rehearsed version of modus ponens, if P then Q, uh, that's part of intelligence today. Uh, and if you give a question to somebody you know, go back in time and give it to somebody in the 18th century or the 12th century, they're not going to get it. And it's because they're not as intelligent as we are. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, what, what counts as intelligence is a moving target. And a lot of people today, unfortunately, are missing part of, of their reasoning armamentarium that they need to have. Mm -hmm. So, so that being said, because, so if we're saying that we've, we've gotten sort of more intelligent every hundred years or so, um, uh, this is, what, what is main, what is the main contributor to that? Is it, is it logic? Uh, is it something similar to, to logic or is it, um, a, a different sort of, uh, of aspect or branch of, of, of reasoning? Well, uh, question of why we've gotten smarter. I mean, schools have changed. Schools are a moving target. I mean, <clears throat> there are kindergarten kids get versions of problems that are on IQ tests. I mean, uh, and probably because <laughs> teachers or educators uh, want to show that uh, 
learning these things are important to intelligence. So the things that are on IQ tests are, are primed by stuff that you learn in kindergarten, first grade, et cetera. Um, so, um, but there are other things that have contributed to, to our increased intelligence. Right after World War II, maybe six or seven percent of the population had a college degree. I mean, college degrees gives you a huge number of cognitive skills, including just the simple one of vocabulary. I mean, the larger your vocabulary, the smarter you are, the more concepts you can deal with. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, a college degree uh, increases uh, vocabulary by about a standard deviation. For your listeners who don't do statistics, mm -hmm. that that's that's like the equivalent of going from an IQ of 100 to an IQ of 115, mm -hmm. if you're just talking about vocabulary. Right. So these are huge differences that come from education. Education has changed. There's more of it for more people. A lot of the modern world with computers and computer games uh, contribute uh, to our increased intelligence. Um, and uh, television. I mean, when I was growing up, you know, there was there were lots of very nice TV programs, but they didn't actually make much of an intellect in the way of intellectual demands. I mean, I Love Lucy was terrific, but you weren't going to learn a lot about how to think uh, from watching that. Uh, a lot of TV shows today, I mean, I sit and watch them with my wife and I have to say, hey, what's going on here? I mean, or what did he mean by that? Or what, I mean, it's the complexity. Uh, yeah, the complexity has grown and it forces you to kind of right. yeah, f figure out what's going on a little bit, a little bit more than. Yeah. So you mentioned tricks, you mentioned sort of cognitive tricks um, that we can we can implement to um, to uh, help navigate uh, our modern world. What, what are some of these cognitive tricks? Okay. One of my favorites is the law of large numbers. And you cannot be a fully effective person in the world we live in if you don't understand the law of large numbers, which says that more evidence is better than less evidence. And a small amount of evidence uh, can be very, very mistaken, giving you a very bad idea of what's, of what's going on. If you ask a University of Michigan freshman, first day of class, you say, you know, um, every year in the baseball season, uh, toward the beginning of the season, there are several batters who had averages of 450 or higher, but no one's ever finished the season with an average of 450. Why do you suppose that is? They want a reason causally. They say, well, the, the, the pitchers make the necessary adjustments or Right. They get cocky and start screwing around. After four years at the University of Michigan, you ask that same question to a student. And I'll say, well, you know, early in the season, there are not that many at-bats. I mean, so you can get, you know, extreme numbers. I mean, think about it. Uh, your first at-bat, uh, your average is either zero or one, and nobody's ever ended up with either of those numbers either. It's because right. you need... Uh, and I actually, I've had disagreements, especially with Danny Kahneman, on whether you can teach people that rule in the abstract, the law of large numbers in the abstract, and have it affect the way they they reason. And believe me, you can. I mean, sure. college education does wonders for that particular problem. A statistics course will do it. I can do it in the laboratory in 15 minutes. I can teach the law of large numbers, and then give people in huge types, hugely different types of content and show that they can now apply that rule. Um, so, you know, in the information age, we're exposed to information all the time. And a lot of <clears throat> what we're responding to is what uh, some people call uh, a man who statistic, as in, I know a man who. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, Anna, so basically what you're saying is, uh, yeah, I, people default to to anecdotes, right? They like they like a they like a nice little story 
that tells a lesson and, uh, you know, more complex ways of learning require more effort. And so we might, you know, we might try to avoid those because it's more effort, right? Um, I know that when I was in the, so I, I was in analytics before and, um, and I've, you know, you, you present something to an executive and you show, you know, all these changes in percentage and, you, you know, most of these percentages are, uh, you know, let's say they're, you know, down 5%, down 3%. And you try to highlight them because you know, those are the important ones. But then you have that very bottom of the row, you know, N equals five employees minus 25%. Doesn't matter how much you talk about the, the, the sample sizes, doesn't matter how much you talk about what you want them to focus. Every, every executive likes to focus on that big number and that tiny N because it stands out, right? Um, and, it, you know, definitely the default is not to consider how many, how many individuals or how many measurements went into that extreme number. Um, does this, does this uh, w- would you explain this as, um, as sort of that sort of reasoning probably had an evolutionary advantage or, or rather that we never needed to understand large numbers we never from an ev- to right? understand numbers. I mean, it's a different world. And I mean, for me, the, it's, it's so dramatic what's going on right now with COVID. I mean, a very large fraction of the population has no idea how to think about that. <clears throat> they don't know how to do this simple cost benefit analysis. I mean, I have uh, my cousin uh, has a son-in-law who has not gotten the COVID vaccination nor has his wife. And if you ask him why, he says, well, you know, I read you know, on the internet about this guy who got the vaccination and he had complete organ failure. So, oh, okay, well, let's see, that's one complete organ failure due to the vaccination and 600,000 organ failures <laughs> due to not having had the vaccine. Right, right. Uh, it's, I mean, to people with a college education, certainly with postgraduate education in the sciences, that's a mistake that can't be made. I mean, it, 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 it it's so ludicrous, it's totally obvious. But let me, let me give you examples not quite so obvious. I, I was, uh, <clears throat> first time I was in England, I spent uh, 10 days in London and it was gorgeous, it was a summer, it was gorgeous weather, blue sky every day. And I left London thinking, you know, the, the English are such crybabies. I mean, they're always complaining about the weather, but it was, you know, it's, I found it to be absolutely fabulous. My punishment was that a few years later, I went to London in November and it never stopped raining the entire time. (laughs) So, you know, no matter how well you understand the law of large numbers, you're not going to apply it wherever it's needed. But learning about it formally does help you in a huge range of situations. Uh, So it seems like an uphill battle. to 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 undertake the challenge of just purely teaching statistical reasoning and and i mean mainly i think i would agree with you that it's it's absolutely possible it's i think it's pretty straightforward to, if you use the right examples and stuff to teach people even abstract statistical concepts i mean i take i took a lot of pride when i was teaching you know the uh, intro methods or, or research methods or statistics courses, you know, if, if, the, if the example's right, you can kind of teach people to, to think a little bit more statistically. Um, of course, the problem then becomes once they, you know, how long it lasts, how long do they apply, how long do they apply the statistical thinking? And, and are, are, are you going to teach them at so much that they can use it when they need it the most, because, you know, if it's something, if you're encountering a situation where, you know, you don't have 
you don't have the luxury of time or you're under stress or cognitive load, you're right, your mind's busy. That's when you sort of go back to these default, default, uh, imperfect methods of thinking. Um, so do you think that, I mean, how much statistical training are you going to need in order to actively apply it in, in all the situations that matter? Is this something that you could do in a, you think it's a workshop or do you think this is something that might even be a multi-year kind of a lifelong uh, thing that, that in order to, to get the most benefit out of it? Well, I have kind of an optimistic answer to that. I mean, <clears throat> I think uh, the law of large numbers becomes part of your intuitive reasoning equipment. Uh, and it's often there when you need it. Not always. I mean, it, uh, my, I, I failed to apply the law of large numbers to my experience in England. Uh, and, um, and I'm sure that I, I've, I failed constantly. Enough. I mean, my favorite example of, uh, of a failure to apply the law of large numbers uh, which causes a lot of grief uh, and which is very difficult to overcome by just teaching the law of large numbers, even if you were very, very clear about how it should be applied. And that's the job interview. People feel like in the 30 minute job interview, they've learned a lot about what someone is like and have a, you know, a pretty good idea of how they might function in their new role as a college student, a medical student, a, a, a military officer, a, a business executive. And the truth is the 30 minute job interview is virtual or 30 minute interview for anything, educational choice, uh, is virtually worthless. Uh, it has almost no predictive power. Uh, and uh, it's very hard to get pe people will, sort of believe that, okay, if you say so, doc. Uh, but <laughs> meanwhile, they interview somebody and they're pretty darn sure that they've got a pretty good uh, a bead on this guy, what, what this person is like. And I'm that way too. I mean, I sit there, I talk with somebody for 30 minutes. I have a pretty good idea of their intellect, yeah. their personalities. No, I don't. I mean, <laughs> but uh, so some, sometimes it's extremely difficult to apply uh, reasoning principles, which we understand very well in a conscious way, and which we ap apply to an indefinitely large number of events in everyday life. We just don't apply to all of them. All right. <clears throat> so um, let's let's stay on this topic because uh, uh, there are, there are, there are a lot more uh, sort of tricks or, or, or ways in which you can think a little bit more clearly, think better that you talk about in, um, in uh, Mindware. Uh, what, are, what are some other, uh, other ways, uh, adjustments in thinking that will lead to more, to more positive outcomes? Uh, well, uh, let's take another problem that I give to people as freshmen or as seniors. Um, I say, I have a friend uh, named Catherine and she's kind of a foodie. She's uh, an industrial representative. She goes to different cities all the time. And whenever she's got a, a restaurant that's been very strongly recommended to her, she goes there and tries them out. And sometimes she gets an absolutely spectacular meal. But she finds that she's typically disappointed when she goes back to that same restaurant again. Uh, why do you suppose that is? People start reasoning causally. Uh, they say, oh, well, you know, maybe um, you know, the chef's change or maybe, you know, she just, her expectations were too high and so she was gonna be disappointed. And then you say, oh, okay, let's see. Now, do you think that it's, it's common to find uh, restaurants where every single meal is going to be terrific? Or do you think it's more common to find restaurants where some meals would be terrific and others would be merely very good and some not even terrific at all? Maybe. Oh yeah, I, they, they, people understand that uh, that there's variability and the experiences that you can have in a restaurant. 
And the principle here, it's a mixture of the law of large numbers and the regression principle. <clears throat> the regression principle says that ex extreme events are likely to be less extreme the next time you encounter them. I mean, so if you have an absolutely wonderful time with someone you just met at a party, don't assume <laughs> that it's a guarantee you're going to have such a marvelous time the next time. It's because extreme events are rare. Right. So the it's for those that might know the pop culture example of the Madden, the Madden effect, which is a, a player, they call it the Madden curse because a player ends up on the cover of the Madden football video game and then they don't do as well the next season. And, you know, to your point, uh, everyone looks for some sort of causal, causal explanation. You know, they, the fame got to their head or, uh, or, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a really common one. Um, but, in reality, they produced a, in order to get on to the cover of, of the, of the Madden game, they had to, have, had to have had an extremely good season the, the prior year, one that, you know, typically would be called an outlying season, something that's an anomaly. And that's how they get onto the game. And of course, when they just go, perform slightly slightly worse the, the next year, which is almost certain, right? You're not going to get more extreme the next year, then, you know, of course, you know, it's expected that you, you, you know, regress, you, you get cl uh, closer to what your average performance would be. Right. But you're, you're right. It's a perfect example of people searching for causal explanations where there, there isn't a causal explanation. <laughs> the explanation is statistical at base. Uh, you know, the rookie of the year, why did he do so well? Well, I mean, it was a fantastic year. He was in good health. He had particularly good coaching that year. Uh, he was, uh, uh, was going to get married. He's having a very happy social life. Uh, and the next year, you know, he has a cold. Uh, the engagement is broken off. His father becomes, you know, extremely ill. I mean, stuff happens. <laughs> and uh, so you don't expect extreme events to remain that way. Uh, kind yeah. Of an yeah. They, yeah. They, it's, 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 it's awfully, I mean, I know personally it's, it's kind of frustrating as somebody who um, is, who taught statistics that um, this, this incessant desire to explain everything with causal factors, you see it, uh, you know, you see it, uh, sports commentators talking about events that occur in, in football game. I mean, I'm a big NFL fan. You see it in the NFL all the time. They're saying, well, is, you know, he's probably, his head's not in the game or he needs to work on this. He needs to work on that. And you're talking about an event that probably had a 50, 50 chance of success anyway. And, and, and the commentator is focusing on these, all these causal elements. Um, so Given your experience looking at all of these um, sort of uh, some would call blind spots in cognition, um, obviously there is some sort of benefit to the way that we think. It's not, it's not, I, I mean, we, we can identify these as, fa as faults with respect to sort of a formal logic, right? And, and, and re with respect to statistics, like you're not thinking statistically, you're thinking in stories, right? But there's obviously some sort of benefit. How do you take advantage of these blind spots in terms of what they are actually doing and combine them with proper statistical reasoning? Like wh what, would, what would be your recommendation? Well, <clears throat> we found that just teaching a statistical principle in the abstract uh, will produce a lot of, I mean, a few minutes, I mean, 15 minutes on the regression principle or the law of large numbers. Um, 15 minutes in the abstract will improve people's uh, ability to reason about a huge range of, pro of problems. Um, giving people a couple of examples, uh, uh, especially if you uh, spread them across domains, an example in the sports domain, and another example in the social uh, engagement uh, domain. 
um, the, uh, uh, again, a few minutes and you've changed people forever. I mean, that's it goes back to what I was saying, the, what the optimistic story, the optimistic story about statistical and probabilistic reasoning is you can get a hell of an increase in ability to apply these principles or even cost benefit analysis, for example. Uh, the, the concept of opportunity cost in economics, the, con the con concept of, of sunk cost, which I could talk about if you're interested, these things can be taught. A single example will change people across, almost across the boards. I mean, a huge range of events. How, that's the good news. The bad news is you're never going to apply a statistical principle everywhere that it's the appropriate tack to take. I mean, it's, you can get a huge increase, but you're never going to get perfect. And there's always going to be a, a lot of, I mean, it's, you know, child's play to point out errors that people make, including me, uh, because we fail to use some probabilistic principle or some microeconomic principle and so on. Uh, so it's a, it's a, it's very much a half full, half empty. <laughs> kind right. Of so, so you mentioned, uh, you mentioned uh, COVID-19 a little bit earlier um, and, and how, you know, this is like, you know, the perfect little case study in terms of, uh, of thinking, you know, going awry. Um, uh, if you had to, like, if you were a public policy, if you had the ear of somebody who was uh, at the CDC or someone that was in charge of publicly communicating the message and trying to perhaps persuade someone to get the vaccine based on, you know, what, what you know about certain principles, what, what, what would be your, the, the way that you would tackle that kind of problem? Well, you know, I think about that as you would imagine. I think about it all the time. I mean, how do you get through to these people who say, you know, I know a man who, so I'm not going to, you know, woman who back, vaccinated her baby and the next day the baby was autistic. I mean, how do you deal with that? Honestly, I think, I think most people are not taught science in such a way that they can apply it in everyday life. They don't understand that there's such a thing as expertise, which comes from having studied a particular problem and applied good principles to it. Uh, they, they sort of, you know, okay, that's your conclusion from, you know, 100,000 cases. And my conclusion from knowing old Joe is this. So right. what do you think about that? <laughs> yeah, I always, I always tell people that, uh, um, it's, it's, you know, if, if you're, especially if you have a, a teenager or a college age student, uh, it's super important to have them learn how to become an expert on something, just become an expert on something. Because when you, when you start to go down that path of digging and learning and, and, uh, realizing that like some people argue this and some people argue that, and there was a debate and then they ended up, you know, developing that this was, this was the conclusion. It doesn't even matter what the topic is. It could be anything from you know baseball to you know social psychology in my case. Um, but when you do that process, you um, you you know it changes your language. It, you know you start to say things. I, I noticed after grad school, I, used, I started to say things like, "Well, I would argue, right?" So I'm making I'm making a, a, a case. I'm not saying I believe. I'm saying I would argue. Uh, and I'd say things like, um, well, that's possible or that's likely or that's unlikely. And, you know, th this I think that the process of going deep into that domain over the course of six years or so was responsible for for being able to change the language that you use when you talk about these issues. I don't know if you would ag agree. Yeah, actually, I think about this a lot. I, the, the question of expertise, it's very important. I, I mean, uh, I think people, there's a New Yorker cartoon, a guy standing up in an airplane and he's saying, I'm getting sick of uh, these airlines thinking that I, they only let pilots fly the planes. How, how many people are like for me to fly the plane for a while? And several hands go up. I guess I, <laughs> I, there, that's a case where we perfectly well understand there's a question of expertise. We don't have it. Most people don't have it. Some people do. Uh, I don't know why no why isn't it? we understand there's a, such a thing as expertise in, in filling teeth 
and expertise in, in repairing cars. Uh, and we, but we're blind to the, the, the question of expertise, the kind of expertise that scientists have. And, it, it, and that you don't, you if literally, you're making a colossal error thinking that your opinion about some matter counts if there's formal scientific opinion against it. People, I, I don't, yeah. they understand that my Dick Nisbet's opinion about how to fix a, a, a radiator is worthless. Right. <laughs> Their own opinion is worthless, but they don't understand that, you know, my opinion about some social psychological point, you know, it ain't worthless. Uh, it, it was hard won, the knowledge that people, they just don't. So you would think that what you're describing, become expert in something and you'll recognize that expertise is, is important for everything. And it doesn't work that way. I mean, it, it, it helps for sure, I think, to, to become expert in something, to realize everything's got an expertise associated with it, which I may or may not have. And I, and I really think that that's, that's very much at the heart of the, of the COVID problem. People don't understand that there is an expertise. It doesn't help, by the way, that the CDC has been unbelievably incompetent. <laughs> I mean, yeah, mixed messaging, right, right, yeah. Uh, I mean, so you say, well, look, these people are experts. You should believe them. I should believe them. And they made so many, I can point to six mistakes they've made. True. Yeah, and, and, and I think... Um... The, the, the lack of clarity, the lack of, uh, uh, you know, the stuff like that is what I think definitely contributes. Uh, it drives people to basically say, um, you know, once they get a little seed of distrust, it's all right, I must think on my own. It's like, I, I, I have to think on my own now. And that might actually be good for some people. But, uh, you know, that's, it's, it's, it's not good in the grand scheme of things when, when you're kind of resisting, you know, when you're resisting something as straightforward as this vaccine is safe, or more importantly, it's safer than the alternative, right? That's the, that's the more important point. It's safer than the alternative. Not, who cares about how safe it is? Yeah, people, people are missing the cost benefit analysis machinery there. And I don't know why it's so common that people can't apply cost benefit to so many problems. That one I really don't understand. I understand making mistakes because you don't know the statistical rule, mistakes because you don't understand the probabilistic rule, making mistakes because you don't understand the fundamental cost benefit yeah. <laughs> analysis. I, I don't I don't have I don't have much sympathy with that. I have to say right. Well I'm definitely you've definitely inspired me to to tackle that question on a, on a future podcast, perhaps with a different guest, why, why it's so difficult to, uh, to convince people to, to, uh, to, to, to think clearly and to have respect for intellectuals, but that will be definitely for another time. Uh, thank you so much for being on. Um, uh, I, as I, as I said, in our pre-interview, uh, it, it's a pleasure to talk to you. It had, had a lot of influence over some of my master's work. So uh, thank you very much for being on today. Thank you. For more on Richard, visit his website, www.richardnisbet.com. That's R-I-C-H-A-R-D-N-I-S-B-E-T-T. While there, check out his newest book, Thinking, a Memoir, as well as some of his other titles. Be sure to follow the Why Do We Do That Facebook page for updates and additional content. Don't forget to rate and write a review on iTunes. Follow on Instagram at Why Do We Do That Podcast or Twitter at WDWDTPod. As always, feel free to email me at why do we do that podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Dr. Ryan Moyer, hoping you found some answers to the question, why do we do that? <laughs>